So now let's just do a quick comparison between SN2 and SN1 reactions for all the different factors that affect them. So what I do want you to keep in mind here is that again, SN2 is all about backside attack and SN1 is all about forming that carbocation. And that'll explain a lot of our uh, a lot of the parts of our trends here. So the first thing I'll look at is that substrate. And for SN2 doing backside attack, I want the least steric hindrance possible. So methyl halides are the fastest, primary is still pretty fast, secondary are kind of slow, tertiaries don't react at all. So whereas SN1, which again, let's form that best carbocation possible, tertiaries are the fastest, secondaries second, and then primary and methyl generally don't form unless they're resonant stabilized. So if you look here, I bolded in the methyl and the primary here for SN2, and I did that because Methyl and primary halides generally can only do SN2, not SN1. Again, provided there's no resonance possible. And then I highlighted over here for SN1, the tertiary, because you can't do SN2 with a tertiary halide. Backside attack's completely blocked. So those, your substrate, if it's methyl or primary, kind of indicates SN2 most likely. And SN1, if it's tertiary. So when it's secondary, that's the problem, because secondary halides might have a chance of either doing SN1 or SN2. Uh, let's move on to the nucleophile here, and we said SN2, you absolutely, absolutely have to have a strong nucleophile, and I like to think that you're stronger with two arms than with only one, uh, or something like that, and so SN2 is the one that requires a strong nucleophile, uh, and in this case it shows up in the rate determining step, it shows up in the rate law, it's got to be strong. Whereas for SN1, uh, in this case, uh, the nucleophile is not involved in the slow step, the nucleophile is not in the rate law, and a weak one is just fine. Uh, moving on to the solvent. Uh, for the solvent, I'll start with SN1 here. So again, it's all about the carbocation, and we need to stabilize that carbocation, and that's what polar protic solvents do. They solvate and stabilize ions well. So for SN1, the solvent has to, has to, has to be polar protic. But for SN2, it turns out polar aprotic would be preferred, and in some cases necessary, but sometimes we can get away with solvents that are polar protic for some of those larger nucleophiles. So finally, we'll move on to the leaving group, and there's no difference here. Same trend as we spoke of before. So for the halides, iodide's the best, chloride's the worst, or technically fluoride's the worst, but it usually doesn't even uh, make our list. It's such a bad leaving group. Uh, and OTS would be better than all the halides if it shows up in this section. Uh, finally, a couple other things to keep in mind. So we talk about rearrangements. So it's carbocations that rearrange, and since carbocations are in SN1, not SN2 reactions, they're possible in SN1, but not possible in SN2. And then some stereoselectivity you got to worry about. With backside attack, if it happens at a chiral center, you get Walden inversion. Whereas if it happens at a chiral center in an SN1 reaction, you'll get racemization as you can attack either side of that carbocation. So inversion for SN2, racemization for SN1. Let's see how we apply this to predicting some products here. All right, so I've kind of left our comparative table up to help us uh, predict some products here. Uh, first thing we'll do in looking at a reaction is look at your substrate, your alkyl halide, and the carbon attached is a primary carbon, and we can see that, oh, that's possible for SN2, it's not possible for SN1 if there's no resonance, and there'd definitely be no resonance stabilization of any carbocation here, so SN1's not even possible, this is going to be an SN2 reaction, but if we move further here, so sodium hydroxide, notice sodium's a metal, oxygen a nonmetal. this is an ionic compound, so even though the positive and negative charges aren't shown, hydroxide has a negative charge, and he is definitely a strong nucleophile, which we definitely needed for our SN2 reaction as well. So finally, everything's lining up here. DMF is one of your polar aprotic solvents you're supposed to memorize. So everything's lining up to show this is SN2. And our hydroxide ion here is going to do backside attack, kick off the chlorine, So, and that's going to leave us with the OH replacing the chlorine. Now, we did not form a chiral center here. So it did not take place at a chiral center anyways. And so we're just going to get one achiral product here, uh, one propanol. All right, so predicting our products here, we got to figure out which mechanism we're even doing first. And first thing we'll do is focus on our substrate, and that's our alkyl halide. And that carbon the halogen is attached to is a tertiary carbon. And we see that SN2 is not even possible now. It rules it out completely. So we're looking at SN1. If we look at ethanol here, and just notice that's the only thing listed, that's going to make it both our nucleophile and our solvent. So in this case, he's not a strong nucleophile. A lot of people see the OH and they think, oh, just like NaOH, it's strong. But keep in mind, uh, sodium's a metal, and so whereas NaOH is ionic, and therefore there's positive negative ions, so here the oxygen's attached to a carbon, which is another nonmetal. That's not an ionic bond. He is definitely not strong. There's no negative charge here whatsoever. So he is a weak nucleophile, and that's totally okay. He also, having an OH bond, is protic. 
So in this case, polar protic, and everything lines up to say that this is going to be an SN1 reaction. Uh, and so in this case, when you do an SN1 reaction, first thing I recommend you do is actually draw out the carbocation intermediate, because uh, you always got to check for rearrangements. And so in this case, our carbocation that forms is going to be on a tertiary carbon, and all three adjacent carbons would not be better than that, so there's no rearrangement going to take place here. So that is where our ethanol is going to attach. And I'm going to skip some steps here. I know it takes a couple steps and you get a proton transfer reaction stuff, but in this case that's where our ethoxy group attaches in the end. So we have an OCH2, CH3. Make sure you're attaching through the oxygen since he's the atom that attacked or attached. So don't draw CH3, CH2O. You want to attach it through the oxygen here. Uh, we did not form a chiral center here. He does not have four different groups. This carbon here and this carbon here due to the plane of symmetry in this molecule are totally equivalent. And um, with no chiral center form, this is your single achiral product. Okay, to determine which mechanism is involved in this reaction here, first thing we'll do is investigate our alkyl halide, our substrate. And we see that it is a secondary substrate. And that's a problem. So if I want to make a tricky question for you on the exam, I'm going to give you a secondary substrate here. Uh, because that doesn't rule out either SN1 or SN2. They're both possible here. So the next thing we'll do, substrate didn't distinguish anything. We'll move on to the nucleophile. So, and in this case, the only thing listed is methanol. And that probably means it's going to be both our nucleophile and our solvent. It's not for sure. But in this case, methanol, there's no negative charge at, at all. It's not an ionic compound. And it is therefore a weak nucleophile. And that's going to mean we're not doing SN2. So here we're doing SN1. So, and now that we know we're doing SN1, keep in mind also he is a polar protic solvent. So that also helps us out with SN1. Uh, but since we're doing SN1, first thing that's going to happen is leaving group's going to leave. And again, if you're doing SN1, I highly recommend first thing you do is draw out the carbocation. It's going to result and see if it's going to rearrange. In our case, it's a secondary carbocation. And the two adjacent carbons, one's secondary, one's primary, neither one would be any more stable as a carbocation. So no rearrangement going to take place here. So, and then methanol, that's where ultimately he's going to attach. Now, again, it takes two steps. I realize there's a proton transfer, but in the end we are going to attach an OCH3 right there. Now, this happened on a secondary carbon, and we gotta be careful, that actually is a chiral center. And so in this case, it is gonna form a racemic mixture, at least we say racemization takes place, so not perfectly 50-50, as you might recall. And so there's a couple different ways to do this. That's the only chiral center. Sometimes we just write plus and minus to show that both enantiomers form. So more commonly, though, your professors may want you to actually draw out both versions. So one here with the wedged bond and one here with the dashed bond. So both R and S here form, uh, we get that racemization taking place. So two products here and they're related as enantiomers. All right, so to determine the mechanism here, first thing we'll look at is our substrate, our alkyl halide. And this carbon in particular is a secondary halide. And if you recall, both SN2 and SN1 can both react with secondary halides. So that tells us nothing. So we'll move on to the nucleophile here. And that nucleophile here is NaSH, which is ionic, sodium metal, sulfur nonmetal. So, and it's specifically the SH minus that is our nucleophile and having a negative charge, he is strong. And that kind of lends us going, leaning heavily towards SN2. Notice with SN1, we don't say weak is required, we say weak is okay, because maybe it involves a strong nucleophile, but that's usually not the trend. So leaning towards SN2 here. And finally, if we look at DMSO, uh, DMSO is one of your polar aprotic solvents, and it kind of seals the deal for SN2. Uh, but tricky here, because sulfur is one of your larger nucleophiles, and whether the solvent's aprotic or protics, NASH can do an SN2 reaction regardless. But in this case, I kind of made it easy on you, giving you one of your polar aprotic solvents, DMSO. Uh, but definitely doing SN2 here. And doing SN2, we're going to be doing backside attack. And in this case, this is indeed happening at a chiral center. And so when you do SN2 at a chiral center, you got to remember that Walden inversion takes place. And so in this case, your product has the SH on the wedge, not the dash. You get a single chiral product in this case. Okay, to determine the mechanism on this example, first thing we'll do is look at that substrate. And 
the carbon where our halogen is attached is a secondary carbon, and I keep in mind that doesn't tell us anything. Both SN1 and SN2 can react with secondary halides. So, but one helpful thing here, maybe you've already noticed, is that there's silver nitrate in there, which aids in carbocation formation. And that's a big hint. This might be SN1. We definitely don't have to have silver nitrate involved in SN1 reactions, but if it is involved, it's probably SN1. Uh, in this case, though, we can kind of just go down our trend here. So the substrate being secondary told us nothing really. Uh, our nucleophile is water, and water is a weak nucleophile, and for SN1, weak is okay, but for SN2, strong would be required. We're not doing SN2, essentially. Uh, so everything confirmed, again, silver nitrate being there as well. Water is also our solvent. This is a solvolysis reaction, and water is polar protic. Uh, everything indicates SN1 here. Uh, so first thing that's going to happen is our leaving group's going to leave. And again, if you're doing SN1, I highly recommend you draw out your carbocation just to make sure it's not going to rearrange. And in this case, our carbocation is going to be secondary. So that means it's bonded to two adjacent carbons. This adjacent one over here is primary. It's not going to rearrange there. And this one is secondary. And on initial inspection, it looks like we're not going to have a favorable rearrangement. And unfortunately, you'd be wrong if that's what you thought. But this secondary one, even though he's secondary, he's going to be better because he's secondary and he's benzylic, which means he's going to be resonant stabilized. So on initial inspection, it didn't look like it's going to get any more stable. And it's not getting any more substituted, but it is going to get more stable because it's going to get resonance stabilized. And so we're going to do a hydro shift. We're going to send one of our hydrins right over. So, and that's going to leave this carbon over here now with four bonds. So he's no longer a carbocation. But this carbon, which gave the hydrin away, now only has three bonds. And so he is our carbocation. So, but being one bond away from the pi electrons of the benzene ring, this thing is benzylic. So, and very stable, being stabilized by resonance in this case. Uh, it's not going to rearrange again, and in this case, that's where water is going to come and attack or attach. So, and I'm going to skip a couple steps again. So, I'll skip at least one step anyways with the proton transfer, but initially the entire water molecule attaches, but then another water molecule comes and deprotonates it, and we're going to end up with an OH right there. Uh, this is a chiral center where this occurs at, and so we're forming a chiral center of the product, so racemization is going to take place, and we'll get both the R and the S. That's the only chiral center, so one thing we might do again is write plus and minus, or we might actually draw both enantiomers out. So your two products, in this case, one has the OH on a wedge, and the other has the OH on a dash. There's your two products. So again, different professors have different recommendations on how they want you to show a racemic mixture. Uh, take your pick, uh, whatever your professor wants in, in this case. Okay, to determine the mechanism in this one, again, we first want to examine the substrate, and that's our alkyl halide. And the carbon attached to our halogen is a primary carbon. And on initial inspection, we might be like, oh, it has to be SN2. But it's not just any old primary carbon, it's primary and allylic. It's one bond away from an alkene. And so technically, SN1 is not off the table here. Because if we did form a carbocation, it would be resonance stabilized. So we've got to go further. So our substrate doesn't help us determine which mechanism in this case. So we'll move on to the nucleophile here. And your nucleophile is this guy, and he's an alcohol. And being an alcohol, he is a weak nucleophile. Now I drew out the line angle formula here, because the other ones we've just shown kind of condensed structure for like methanol, ethanol, water. So I want to draw one out, but it's the same thing. He's still just a weak nucleophile, and that kind of indicates we're doing SN1, not SN2. Also note, being an alcohol, he is a polar protic solvent, which kind of goes hand in hand with the fact that we're doing SN1. And again, anytime you do SN1, the first thing I recommend you do is draw your carbocation to make sure it's not going to rearrange. So and in this case, we've got this lovely primary carbocation. And it's not going to rearrange, though, because it's not just primary. It's also stabilized by resonance here. So we can draw another resonance structure, moving the pi electrons over there. And our other resonance structure looks like so. And so this is a little bit tricky. We find out that our carbocation actually shares the positive charge between this primary carbon and this secondary carbon. So you can't really call it a primary carbocation. You also can't really call it a secondary. It's sharing the positive charge on both. So it's a combination of like a primary secondary or something like that. 
that's how I like to say it. But uh, positive charge is shared in two locations. But because of that as well, that means our nucleophile isopropyl alcohol here can attack either location. He can attack this carbon or he can attack this carbon. And if they're not equivalent structures, then you're actually going to get two different sets of regioisomers here. So let's draw one here. The first one we might just attach. And again, I'm skipping a proton transfer step again. Um, but we might just attach the isopropoxy group there. Uh, in the other case, we might attach it there instead. Now, in the first example, we did not uh, do the substitution at a chiral center. So you're going to form that achiral product. In the second example, though, we did form a chiral center. So again, we're going to form both the R and the S versions of it. And we might write plus or minus, or your professor may prefer that you actually show the stereochemistry. Whatever they want from you. Do what they go with. Cool. And there's your two uh, chiral products, in this case, enantiomers. Uh, so overall, I guess in this case, actually I should point out, though, that it's actually three products. These two enantiomers and this product above up here. So be careful. When you form a resonant stabilized, in this case a lilic carbocation, you might actually be substituting at more than one location. Be careful. All right, this final example here. Uh, take a look. We want to look at the substrate first, and that's your alkyl halide. And the carbon the halogen attached to is a primary carbon, and that's going to indicate SN2, especially because resonance is not possible here uh, for any resulting carbocation. So no SN1 possible here. Uh, the other side of the coin is, is here we have phosphorus, and phosphorus, even without a negative charge, is still a strong nucleophile. So one of those neutral ones, either on sulfur, phosphorus, or nitrogen, that even without a negative charge is still pretty darn strong. So in this case, we're definitely doing SN2. The kicker is ether is the solvent, and ether was one of your classic polar aprotic solvents. And so in this case, we're going to come in with phosphorus and do backside attack, and that's going to cause the leaving group to leave. And if we kind of see what this looks like here, so a little bit of a pain in the butt to draw this. And now we've attached a three carbon chain. The phosphorus attached to that three carbon chain, but phosphorus with four bonds has a positive formal charge. And so we're actually ending up with a positive formal charge, but this is your product. Now the substitution happened at this carbon. It's not a chiral center, so I don't have to worry about, uh, you know, uh, Walden inversion or anything like that. I mean, inversion happens, I just won't notice the difference in this case, but that's your final SN2 product there. Uh, so we've worked through a number of examples, and I just want to make sure you, you realize how to use this table to kind of predict which mechanism you're doing and predict your products. You're definitely going to want to get very adept at doing this, because in the next chapter we're going to incorporate what are called elimination reactions which sometimes compete with these substitutions, which is going to make this even more complicated. So make sure you work a number of examples and really get this down, uh, especially before moving on to the next chapter.